I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 is where we're going to be hanging out today as we continue our Just Jesus series. Um, if you don't uh, have a Bible or a Bible app with you, then uh, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1025 and you'll find Luke chapter 6. Either that or ask one of the children to help you find Luke chapter 6 because they've been learning that in Calvary Kids and they will help you find it out. If you got your kids with you, then parents, uh, open it up, find it, and sit there with your kids. You guys can follow along and read it together. Hey, uh, before we dive into the message, I thought I'd take just a moment and, uh, and talk about the whole Halloween thing and why we're okay with dressing up and, and doing all that kind of stuff. Because I know some of you grew up in churches where Halloween was kind of like frowned upon or avoided or ignored or what, however they dealt with it. Because you grew up in that kind of church, didn't oh, you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I didn't grow up in that kind of church, but I worked for them. And, uh, and so I, I recognize some things that are really awkward. First of all, you know, Satan is real and spiritual warfare is real. Uh, but last time I checked, we win. And, uh, and so Jesus is Lord. And he's Lord of every single day uh, he's given us. And so we can, Scripture says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And that's what we're doing. And so we're using Halloween as a way to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus by dressing up and handing out candy. Yep. And, and uh, <laughs> why not do it? The other thing that I noticed, and this is what cracked me up, about working at a church where we don't do Halloween because Halloween was evil and all that kind of stuff, was this. Instead of celebrating Halloween, we had a party at the church, called it a fall festival, at, where everybody dressed up and we ate candy. Um, so it was nothing at all like Halloween, and we just happened to do it on October 31st. No coincidence, I'm sure. So, um, but... But what was really funny to me was that they, they had a costume contest for the kids, and they were supposed to, you know, do biblical costumes. <laughs> biblical costumes. And I, and I was in charge of this party, and I always wondered, do you people, like, read the Bible? Because I know what they're thinking. They're thinking they want the little girls to dress up like Mary and the little boys to dress up like shepherds. Boring. That is not the Bible. Last time I checked, do you know the, the Bible has stories about naked people running around? Pastor Chad, this is a family service. It's Genesis 1 and 2. Okay. We want them to read the Bible. They're going to figure that out. It's got demons in it, devils, dragons, you know, murderers. We're good. Prostitutes. Okay. My personal favorite, the whore of Babylon. Mm -hmm. No one ever came as that, but they could have. I'm sorry, Julie. You got yeah, lots of explaining that, to good. do now, don't you? Yes, I do. I always wanted to come to that with a tent peg stuck out of my head. Oh, uh, my goodness. Because there's a story. No, you know, don't clap for the middle egg, on. And judges about that. Biblical costumes. What were they thinking? So, anyway, <laughs> take that for what it's worth. We're using Halloween to lead people to a life changing relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, so today is our superheroes theme. So, I don't know if you noticed, but most of the staff and the band are dressed in superheroes-related uh, uh, outfits. This is about as dressed up as I get for Halloween. Uh, but um, we'll so here's the question. That. We'll work on that. Yeah. Here's the question. And, and I want you to take 10 seconds and, and have this conversation with people around you. If you had a superpower, one superpower, and you could choose what that superpower is, what would it be? Ready, set, go. I never talked about that. What superpower would you want? I'd want to be invisible. Power to clean. <laughs> I told you you have that one. No, I don't. <laughs> oh, all right. You guys can continue that conversation later. Some of you are not actually going to be, have a superpower. We can't give that to you. Uh, now, here's a conversation that I want you to have later. Not now, because I don't want to start any fights. But, um, you know, if... Uh, have, have this conversation over lunch or in your life group... But uh, what is your superpower that people would say you have right now? Mm, how about that? So, Julie, what would people say your superpower is? Oh, I would think that people would say my superpower is the ability to have fun wherever I go. That's right. Whee! So you have super goofy power. Super goof power. There it is. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, what about you? Well, you know, I would say that it's sarcasm, but I'm not sure that's a superpower. No, it is not. Not for the good guys, anyway. Uh, so <laughs> maybe just optimism, just because I believe that everything's going to work out and God's going to redeem it, and, uh, and, and I know he is. he is. So, mm -hmm. hey, truth is, we don't need superpowers. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, 
If you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, then you have the Holy Spirit of God in you. And so you don't need a superpower because with the Holy Spirit, we're always going to win. Always. The, the Spirit gives us the power of truth. And Jesus said, if you remain in my word, that's why I want you to read the Bible, then you are really my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And, and so here's the reality. Because the Holy Spirit is in us, he gives us the power of truth. And today we're going to talk about a life-changing truth that is woven throughout Scripture, that Jesus talks about in this passage. It's a truth that no one can escape or avoid. It, it affects every single one of us. So if we can learn this truth and we can live it like Jesus, it will change our lives. The truth is simply this. We reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. Luke chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. Very short passage, so uh, it should stick in your brain. Jesus says this. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, we put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. We reap what we sow. I have a story for you. You guys want to hear it? Of course. Okay. One late summer night in Broken Bow, Nebraska, a weary truck driver pulled his rig into an all-night truck stop. And just as the kind waitress served him his meal, three big, bad, rough-and-tough motorcyclists walk in. That would be called bikers. That's... Bikers, like okay, a gang. Okay, bikers, fine. That sounds mean. Well, well they, they were mean. These guys were mean. Not all bikers are mean. My dad's one of them. I mean, of the nice ones. So these big, bad bikers walked in. The first one grabbed the guy's hamburger and started eating it. The second one grabbed a handful of his french fries and started munching on them. And the third one went for the real stuff, the coffee. <laughs> grabbed the coffee, took a swig of it, left his back wash, put it back on the table, and gave the guy a stare down. They waited for him to respond, and the man simply took a deep breath. He grabbed his check, went to the waitress, and paid his bill. And then he quietly walked out the door. The waitress followed him to the door and watched him drive away. And one of the bikers said, Hey, he ain't much of a man, is he? And the waitress said, I don't know about that, but he ain't much of a truck driver because he just ran over three motorcycles. <laughs> don't. Have you guys ever heard of this saying, what goes around? You may have also heard of karma. Um, Julie, here yes. at Calvary, we believe that karma is... Uh, da, 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 this is a family service. Okay, karma is an unbiblical concept that comes out of Hinduism, Buddhism. It isn't real, but what happens is that they took the concept of you reap what you sow that God built into the world, and the biblical concept is what we're talking about. You reap yes. what you sow. And that is true. It, it's not just a biblical law, you reap what you sow. It's actually God's law that you see in nature. Let me explain, children, because I know you're the only ones that need this explanation. But when you sow something, it means you plant it. And when you reap it, you harvest it or receive. So if you were to sow a pumpkin seed, what would you reap? A pumpkin. Good. We're going to exercise this a little bit with some illustrations so you don't forget. We're going to play a little game. I want everybody to zip their lips. I'm going to show you a seed. Don't tell me what this is going to reap just yet. Let's go ahead and show them the first seed. On the count of three, I want you to yell what this is going to reap or harvest. One, two, three. Good job, a pomegranate. Good. Okay, second seed. Shh. What is this going to reap? One, two, three. <laughs> Very good. Smart kids in the front. I, they are. And the third seed is a little tricky. I'll give you three seconds to think about it. One, two, three. Whoa. Cool. I heard some water. Yeah. Some people I actually if got cheating. that. I don't know. Were they here last night? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, this is really neat. This actually will harvest a plant that produces the water chestnut. So these people here are gathering water chestnuts. Really neat, huh? 
You learn something new every day. You do. Hopefully today you now understand what it means to reap what you sow. The bottom line is no matter what you plant, you will reap what you sow. And, and on that note, let me just uh, talk from my parents. This is why it's so important for you to discipline your children. Sorry, kids. I just told your parents to be mean. All right? <laughs> but here's the thing. They need to be mean because they love you. In the book of Hebrews, the writer says, God disciplines those he loves as a father disciplines his children. So if your parents love you, kids, they're going to they're gonna discipline you. Because when they discipline you, uh, parents, you're teaching your kids that they reap what they sow. You're teaching them cause and effect. You're teaching them consequences to their actions. And, and God entrusts that responsibility to parents to teach that to their kids because they're going to learn it from someone and it's way better for them to learn it from people who love them and want to care for them and protect them instead of learning it from law enforcement or corrections officers. True. Because you're going to reap what you sow. So yes, kids, I'm telling your parents, they need to discipline you to be mean and understand that when they do that and you're not happy with it, it's because they love you and because they want you to learn that you reap what you sow. So. Kids, are you guys listening? You reap what you... They're eating their popcorn. I know they're eating their popcorn, but they can, <laughs> they can still answer the question. So, so parents, discipline your kids. The other thing is, uh, for everyone, look, reaping and, and sowing is a time-consuming activity. In other words, you know, if you want immediate results, and our, like our culture wants it and they want it now. now. We do. We want it right now. We want immediate results. And, and that doesn't happen. If you plant a pumpkin seed tonight, uh, are you going to have a pumpkin tomorrow? No, of course, that would be silly. It takes a season for that to grow, a season for you to be able to harvest it, a season for you to be able to reap it, and it's the same way with God. The Apostle Paul says this in Galatians chapter 6. He says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If he sows to the flesh, he will from the flesh reap destruction. But if he sows to the Spirit, he will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And it's going to take time. And, and you may be saying, hey, I want God to change my life right now. and I want everything different right now. But it's going to take time. It's a process. But the more that you follow God, the more of that you plant into your life, the more of that you're going to harvest over time. And if you do that over years and decades, you will reap a harvest that is amazing and, and wonderful for your life. Because you're going to reap what you sow. And, and just hear this too. It's not too late to start planting the things of God in your life. Wherever you are and whatever you've been sowing up to this point in your life, you can have a new start today. Why not start planting God's life into your life today? Because you're going to reap what you sow. And, and in our passage, Jesus talks about three specific choices that we have to make when it comes to reaping and sowing. So uh, let's just look at this again. Because first of all, he talks about attitudes and words. Attitudes and words. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Judging and condemning. Uh, looking at people and thinking negative things about them and saying those things. That's what judgment and condemnation is about. Words and attitudes. Because we all have a choice. With our attitude, we all have a choice. To think the best about people or to think the worst about people. What's your inclination? Do you look at other people and go, hey, you know what? They make honest mistakes too. They, they, you know, they forget stuff. They don't do it on purpose. It's unintentional, their offenses. Like me, they're imperfect. Or do you decide that you're going to judge people as critically and negatively as possible? That every offense is on purpose and everything is done to offend you. And you're going to withhold the grace that you desperately want to receive. Which one decides or describes your attitude most accurately? Because attitude is really important. Mm -hmm. You're not, yeah. yeah, I know. I'm going to say a little something about that. Okay. Children, you listening? Children, when you wake up in the morning and it's time to go to school, do you have a smile on your face and a good attitude as you roll out of bed? Didn't think so. <clears throat> you can reap what you sow in your attitude, too. If you wake up with your arms crossed going, I don't want to go to school. I don't learn anything anyway. Guess what? You're going to go to school and not learn anything. <laughs> if you get up and have a great attitude about school, even if it's like, I don't love school, but I'm going to go and do my best and learn all that I can to make my parents proud and to make Jesus proud, you're going to go to school and do all that you can. 
You reap what you sow in your attitudes. And parents, just a side note, we can very easily instill our attitude towards school to our children. When they come home with two hours of homework, we can have the attitude of this is so much homework to do, I want to like spend time with you. We can keep that to ourselves or we can give our children that attitude too, which will not help them and we will in turn reap what we sow with that as well. Yeah. So check your tudes. <laughs> so attitudes and words, because every time we open our mouth we have a choice. We can bless or we can curse. We can affirm or we can critique. We can build up or tear down. Every one of us can encourage or we can discourage. God has given us so much power with our words. Do you speak the truth in love or do you use the truth as a hammer? See, what describes you? Because we're going to reap what we sow. And, and this, this made, was made so clear to me in uh, my dad. My, my dad, great guy, loved him uh, and, and miss him. Uh, but he taught all of us boys. He has four boys all of us boys, to question authority, to challenge authority, not, not disrespectfully, but to ask the questions why. Why do you want this? Why do you tell us that we have to do this? Why is it this way? Not to just receive it, but to, to challenge it. And he was really proud of us when we did that until we challenged his authority. <laughs> and he did not like it when we challenged his authority, even though he taught us to do that. And there was a lot of conflict in our home as we grew into that and, <clears throat> and exercised it. You see, but he was reaping what he sowed. So parents, this is a tough one. I'm going to hit below the belt for a minute. If you don't like the words and attitudes of your kids, maybe you need to look in the mirror. Because you are the primary teacher in their life about how to live it, how to speak into it, how to approach it. And so uh, we cannot escape the fact that we have a choice to make about attitudes and words, and we are going to reap what we sow. And we're going to reap what we sow on the matter of forgiveness and mercy. We see throughout the Bible how we can reap what we sow in so many ways. A couple of verses that I like, Matthew 5, 7, Blessed is the, are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And Matthew 6.15 says, but if you don't forgive others, your heavenly Father won't forgive you. We see it in the Bible, and when you hear the word mercy, does it make sense to you? Or do you jumble it up with some other things? I do sometimes, but I'm hoping that this will help you understand what mercy truly means. When you show mercy to someone, it's being kind to them even though you have an opportunity or a really good chance to be mean. Let me give you an example. If your little sister or daughter cut their own hair, has this happened to any of you that you know of? Cut their own hair like way up here, looking a little something like Lloyd from Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> when they walk into the room to show you their new haircut that they are so proud of but they really know it looks terrible, you can use that opportunity to show mercy or to be very mean. You could say, aha, look at you. <laughs> How am I gonna bring you anywhere? It's embarrassing. Or you could show mercy and say, you are beautiful no matter what. You could be bald and be the most perfect human in the whole wide world. You could also say, let me get a really big headband. <laughs> <laughs> Real fluffy one. And your hair is going to grow. That is showing mercy. Um, a few weeks ago, my children had a mutual friend over as it, for a play date. And uh, I have a seven-year-old daughter named Layla, an eight-year-old son named Sawyer. They had a friend over, and we were on our way somewhere, probably to church. And it was time to get in the car. Well, they both wanted to sit by their friend. So, of course, I said, why don't you have her sit right in the middle, middle of you? Perfect, <laughs> right? No, of course not. <sighs> they wanted her all to themselves. So I thought, let's take a moment here. We're going to write your names down, put it in the hat, and we're going to take the pieces of paper out and put them in the locations of where you're sitting in the van. And this is why I'm late to everything, <laughs> by the way, because <laughs> I do things like this. <laughs> so I picked them out, and their friend was sitting here in this location. Sawyer was sitting right next to her and had them all to herself, and Layla was all the way over here by her brother. Well, they sat there, didn't make a peep. Sawyer could have used that opportunity to say, uh -huh, I get my friend all to myself, you're a loser. Instead, he did something miraculous. 
He said, Mom, hold on, don't leave yet. Layla, you can take my seat, and you can sit by our friend. And I almost passed out. <laughs> Please do not think my family is perfect and we do these things all the time, but when those things happen, they are teachable moments. A couple weeks later, Sawyer noticed that his sister and he were having good conversations and being kind to each other, and he said, what is going on here? How is this happening? And I remembered at that very moment, a couple weeks ago, when he gave up his spot for her. When we show mercy and forgiveness in our relationships, it can heal, it can redeem, it can grow our relationships. And parents, the way we treat our spouse, our significant others, our teachers, we are showing our kids how to show mercy and forgiveness. And... As Pastor Chad always says, you want to be a really good example of that because your children are going to be picking your nursing home one day. <laughs> so be merciful because, yeah. uh, you know, because you want to receive mercy. So uh, we're going to reap what we sow in our words and our attitudes. We're going to reap what we sow in forgiveness and mercy. And we're going to reap what we sow in generosity. It's a choice we have to make. Notice what Jesus says, verse 38. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Uh, if we learn this, it changes our attitude about giving to God and blessing others. Uh, and, and let me just, kids, you haven't heard me say this, but your parents probably have if they've been going here for a while. There's some things you need to understand. First of all, God doesn't need your money. God owns everything. It belongs to him. Uh, he's not running out because he's God. He made everything that exists. God doesn't need our money. And the church doesn't need our money. You say, well, why do you have offering boxes by all the doors then? Well, uh, the church doesn't need your money because the church belongs to God. The church is described as being the bride of Jesus and the body of Jesus. Jesus is going to take care of his church. So, Theologically, biblically, the church doesn't need your money. So then why all the offering boxes? Because we need to give to God. We, as followers of Jesus, need to give to God. We need to get this generosity thing figured out because we reap what we sow. So. We reap what we sow. We were created to bless, and it blesses our lives when we're generous. So um, we want to show you what this looks like. And so we've got a family that's going to help us out. Uh, so the Prestons are going to have to come on up here now. And, uh, and, and we're going to give... Oh, it's over here. They move at every service. I don't know where, where the stuff <laughs> it's is. It's just to surprise I the, you. I went the other way la the last time. So we're gonna, we've got a little uh, thing set up. We want to uh, explain things And we're going to dress bit. Mr. Preston up like God. Okay, now, Tim, just understand that you're not God. <laughs> okay. This is really important to make this work. You're not God. You're just playing God on TV. Okay? So um, put on the okay, bling outfit. This. You don't get it taken home because <clears throat> that would oh, be a little bit weird. Oh, isn't that sad, girl? Here's a sash. Okay. I don't beautiful. know that God needs a sash. No. But really, adds. really, that, I, don't, I don't think God does that much with sequins. But uh, <clears throat> He does in all the stories. It works the for stories. us, right? So, okay, so you're God, and, and God, you've got a whole bunch of blessings. Now, um, <clears throat> Melanie, this is your life, okay? This represents your life, and God, you're going to fill her life with all kinds of blessings. And while he's doing that, what are some of the blessings that, that God has filled your life with? Um, our family. Your family, okay. Health. Health. Um, our church family. Church family. You guys have a house to sleep in? House. You have a car? Food. You have food. Have car. I like food. Car. Pets. You have pets. <laughs> uh, you got your, you're kind of happy. <clears throat> Okay, got a job. Uh, yeah, okay, so all these things, God has poured into your life and filled it up. But what happens when it gets f to the top? Can God pour any more into your life when your life is full of his blessings? Okay, so how do you, how do you make room in your life for um, God to bless you more? Okay, so how do you make room in your life for God to bless you more? This is your life. You got to do something with it. Nope, that's not it. Those aren't yours. No, this is yours. This is your life right here. Okay. She's in a fact, mom. She's thinking fact, clean. You're thinking about this. That's okay. Here, this is yours. You're going to be, um, you're going to represent like the church. You're going to represent like homeless people. How's that? Sure. Okay. So um, 
This is your life, and God's poured blessings in it, but he's running out of room to put more blessings in it, so what are you going to do? Because you got one, uh, how, how are you going to handle this? Oh, start emptying it. Start giving it away. Yeah, okay. You know, if you flip it up, it goes faster. So, oh, there you go. And so she's pouring out the blessings into her life. So maybe she's giving some to God. Go ahead. You can, you can fill that up some. Oh, look at that. She's giving some to, to other people to bless in the kingdom. And maybe there's some homeless people. You feel like a homeless? You don't look like a homeless person. So, and maybe, the, you know, you share with the homeless. But see, now there's starting to be some room. And what can God do? to uh, your life. Oh, look, he can kind of pour more blessings into your life. Now, what happens if you get greedy and you, and you stop sharing? Oh, God stops pouring blessings into your life. So if we want God to pour blessings into our life, what do we need to do? Oh, we need to give. You guys are brilliant, by the way. Yeah, as we pour out the blessings that God gives us, it creates room for God to do what? To bless us. Hopefully everyone went to the bathroom before service. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the illustration. <laughs> Preston family, thank you so much for thank sharing. Thank you, Preston. Way to go. Good job. You Excellent guys are troopers. job. Okay, thank and if he thinks starts acting like he thinks he's God, let me know. Yeah. We'll, we'll correct that. We'll lay down the smack in a loving way. In a loving way, of course. Hey, I know that's a silly illustration, and you guys all knew where it was going, but see, we see it. And, and the truth is we need to understand that's exactly what God is saying in Scripture, right? Give, and it will be given, given to you. For with the measure you use, it's going to be measured back to you. How much plainer can Jesus be that we're going to reap what we sow when it comes to generosity? And, and yet we are so tempted to hold on to our things and not to share them, not to give them away, not to, to bless others, not to bless God. And here's the reality, and, and, and I hope this sinks in, that the more generous you become as an individual and as a family, the more you are opening your life to God's blessing you. Because we're going to reap what we sow. Here's how it works. God designed us to be conduits for his blessing. So God blesses us so that we can bless others so that God blesses us more. If we choose not to bless others, we lose out on the more. We've already been blessed. Every one of us in this room has been blessed. But the question is, do you want God to pour his blessings into your life, or do you want to live a selfish life? Now, I, th I think since we reap what we sow, the answer is really obvious. But now here's the thing we need to understand. Uh, we get to determine the amount of blessings that God is going to pour into our lives. We do not get to decide the manner of blessings that God is going to pour into our lives. God gets to decide how he's going to bless us. So uh, a lot of times we want the least important blessings to be poured into our life, right? Least important blessings, uh, money and health. You go, why are money and health the least important? Because I'd be a lot more comfortable if I had more money, and I'd like to feel good until I die. And uh, the truth is uh, that money and health don't translate into eternity. See, you're not going to need any money in heaven. Streets are paved with gold. Who cares? It's worthless. And you're going to get a new body in heaven. Is there anyone excited about that? Yeah. See, everybody who's old is like, yeah, this one's worn out and it hurts. Uh, so here's the deal. We're going to get a new body. We're going to get, you know, we're not going to need money in heaven. So that stuff doesn't last. But what lasts is the character that we live. Love, joy, peace, purpose, contentment, the relationships we have with people. That's why I want to be merciful. See, those things translate into eternity because we live forever in Christ. So we got to decide this. Are we going to trust God to pour blessings into our life when we're generous? And are we going to be okay with the blessings that God chooses to give us in this life? I hope every family that's here will have a conversation with their kids about how you're generous, how you bless others, how you give to God, how you give to help others. And, and if you need some help with that, come see us. We'd be glad to, to give you some ideas about what that looks like. You see, we want to watch our words and our attitudes. We want to forgive and we want to show mercy. And we want to be generous because... We reap what we... So I think they got it. I think they got it too. Let's pray.